We're going to take a reading from Romans chapter 8. We'll begin reading in verse 18 and read down to verse 28. And um, this week, this scripture is all I've been able to think about for almost the whole week. One verse. <clears throat> and um, I don't even remember when I began to think about it, but it's been upon my mind since early in the week. And I pray that it will provide you some encouragement. This chapter, Romans chapter 8, is what I would deem the most encouraging chapter in all of the Bible. Um, there are, what I counted, 18 promises for us. Promises which, some which can be enjoyed in this life, and some waiting for the life to come. But at least 18 things that Paul, the writer here, is telling us, and you can't go more than three or four words of his reading here without so much just spilling over. And so I hope this morning I have one out of 18 that I want to bring before you today. But it's a good one. It's a really good one. And I hope that it will be an encouragement to you. Again, Romans, beginning in chapter 8, verse 18, Paul the writer says this, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth Why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I don't conclude our reading this morning. That's reading Romans chapter 8. I believe verse 18 to verse 27. And the title of our message this morning is very simple. It's drawn from verse 26 of our scripture reading today. And it is titled, The Spirit's Intercession. The Spirit's Intercession. I've already mentioned to you, um, this chapter is chalked full of promises which are indescribably encouraging when God helps us to understand them. And where we began our reading this morning, Paul acknowledges something that we all go through at times, but these people whom he is writing to were going through at this time. Sufferings. Now, perhaps their type of suffering was slightly different than ours. Perhaps not. But he is trying in this scripture, in this portion all the way till the end, to give encouragement through suffering. And one of the things that he appeals to just prior to our reading is that he tells us that those who suffer with Christ will also be glorified with Christ. That's a heavenly promise. 
a future thing that will occur. That if you and I in this life will endure suffering for the cause in the name of Jesus Christ, be it imposed on us by others, be it imposed upon us by circumstance and choices that we make in order to be obedient to God, regardless of the origin of that suffering, if we suffer faithfully for the cause of Christ, we will also be glorified with Him. And then he gets into this scripture that tells us about how all creation is presently groaning and travailing because of the brokenness and fallenness of the natural world. That creation did nothing to cause its corruptible nature. Right? Whenever Adam sinned in the garden and death and corruption befell not only humanity, but creation itself, that was by no fault of creation its own. It was imposed upon it by God and His design as a result of Adam's fall. And yet it tells us that there is this groaning that is taking place in creation to be redeemed. That it is not... And I don't even, to be really honest with you, I don't fully understand that. There is some incompleteness, I suppose, in creation in its present fallen state. And then he adds to that and he says, not only is creation groaning, but our bodies are groaning. Now some of you say, yeah, it was groaning this morning really loud, right? And setting aside the humor of that, there's theological truth in that. That there is a sense to which the exhaustion and the frailty which progressively gets worth throughout life is a form in which your body is groaning. But take note as to what Paul says it is not groaning Because of its frailty, necessarily, it's groaning in anticipation for the removal of that frailty. That suffering is going to be gone. And so when you think of someone lying in a hospital bed, beset with all type of problems, they're groaning for healing. They're wanting the things which presently harm them to be comforted. And Paul says, our bodies are groaning to lay aside its frailty and weakness and pain and to be redeemed. And we await that and we look forward to the redemption of our body. And when we are in the midst of suffering, those two truths, he calls it a hope. Of the redemption of our body. So when your body is falling apart. And there's nothing you can do. And especially as you begin to get to the last days of your life. And your body is groaning for healing. Yet for us that have been born again. We anticipate a redemption of our bodies. I have often desired if God would come back. During my lifetime to be up there. To see the celebration of those whose bodies were redeemed. They groaned then, but now they would be clothed with incorruption. And to be a witness of that, how marvelous of a promise that we have that that one day will occur. And yet those are promises of future things. And... In my own experience, promises of future things only go so far for me. You can tell me that one day this is going to be relieved. And I can try to grit my teeth and hold on a little longer. And yet sometimes in the present, I need those hopes to be realized now. If I am going to find relief, I remember... Different coaches when I would play sports, promise you a water break. 
I put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. And there were days I just need it right now. Or I'm not going to make it. And so it is as though Paul is setting before us one after the other after the other future promises which once realized will provide us comfort and which even now provide us a hope and a comfort that one day they are coming. But in the midst of laying out all of these future promises, Paul pauses and gives us a present promise which can be realized right now. I know what a promise that it is. A wonderful promise that we can enjoy right now. An experiential one. What is more beautiful than the idea of the resurrection? The actual resurrection. Right? We can go to 1 Corinthians 15 and we can read Paul's beautiful description of what the resurrection day will be like. And yet the only thing that will supersede that text is the realization of it. When I am there on that day being clothed with immortality, that far exceeds the study and understanding of it. Paul gives us this text and he's putting out all these hopes for our present suffering. And then he pauses and he says, now let me deal with a, with a, a hope which can be enjoyed. Now that's why he starts verse 27 with the word likewise. Just like those things give you hope, likewise, let this give you hope. And he tells us something. He says, looking in verse, excuse me, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The word also there means joins in. So the Spirit of God joins in to help with our Weakness. Now, the weakness, our weakness is really difficult to plumb to the depth of, really. And it's a wonderful thing when God reminds us of our utter weakness. And I believe here he does it in a doubled fashion. Because one, he acknowledges that we're so weak we have to pray. And in the times of our greatest weakness is when we're compelled to the most heart-rending prayer. And so when you are broken and your circumstance of your life is turned upside down and you're confounded at what to do and how to respond, your weakness is on display. And you're calling out to God in mourning. You're calling burdened. And the very idea that you are praying for help is a sign that you are weak because there's nothing you can do about it. And God over and over in the scriptures encourages us to pray not only in our strength but especially in our weakness. And yet this verse does more than acknowledge that our weakness is what causes us to pray because then it also says, even in our attempt, in our weakness, when we're escaping to pray for help, we don't even know how to pray for help. Think of it like this. If you go to the emergency room and something happened to your child, and you go to the doctor... And the doctor begins to, in a hurried fashion, attend to your child. You don't even know what questions to ask unless you're a medical expert. You don't even know what things could possibly happen. You don't know whether surgery or medication. You don't know if it's fatal. You don't even know what to do. And it's a helpless feeling when you hear a word, a diagnosis. And you don't even know what it means. 
And slowly, as simply as possible, the doctor begins to explain. And you don't even know what question to ask, although your heart and mind is full of unutterable questions. And at the depth of those questions are, are they going to be okay? To what extent will this impact their life? What ongoing provision will be needed? Can you do anything about it? Do we need to go to somebody else? Have you ever seen this before? And in our weakness, in our ignorance, it's very helpful to have a friend. You've all got them. You call someone who is, for me, it's my brother-in-law when it comes to medical things. I call my brother-in-law who's a nurse, who's very intuitive about those things. And I say, what do I even say? What do I ask? How can I phrase this in a way that our language barrier, because there's a medical language and then there's a layman's language. How can I cross over into that language and begin to speak their language but then interpret their answer in a way that I can understand. And so I seek help. But notice, and I I think this is what this verse is saying here, this infirmity, which means the word weakness, is inherent. So, technically with this analogy, I could go and study right now, and I could learn much about the medical field, And no longer would that be a weakness because I have remedied that. But as I studied this, I came to the conclusion, no, this is talking about an unalterable state of our nature. That the Spirit helps us in this weakness and frailty of our nature that we are incapable of changing or remedying ourselves. And so in this low state where words cannot form the questions and needs that we're having, we cast ourselves before God not knowing what to say or how to say it. And there is nothing that we can change about ourselves to make the things that we're bringing before him adequate. And so we appeal to a being infinitely higher than us to help us ask for help. You see, prayer is this, and I've said it again, I've said it before, and I'll say it a hundred times again. Prayer is this spiritual discipline that is so mysterious to me. Because later in the text, it tells us that Jesus is an intercessor for us. And so on one hand, the Spirit is interceding. On another hand, just a few verses later, Christ is interceding. And so, how does that all... And then it says that God, the Father, knows the mind of the Spirit and that the Spirit helps us to pray things according to the will of God. Now, I don't understand hardly anything that I just said. (laughs) In in practical terms. But I will tell you some things that I think I learned this week about this situation that has helped me somewhat, and I hope it helps you. So he gets to first part of what we need help with in our weak attempt to ask for help. So think of it as I'm going to try to help you ask for help. So, how does the Spirit help us ask for help? Well, first Paul points out this, for we know not what to ask. That stunts my prayers very often. I don't even know what to ask. The other day, I got a a, a phone call from my kid's teacher. That would be my wife, right? We homeschool. And uh, misbehavior, a continual habit of misbehavior in this certain little area. I left where I was at, and 
and went home, I was, I was real upset. And I didn't know how to respond to this behavior because it has been recurrent. And I've tried to address it one way, and evidently that didn't work. And I've tried to address it another way, and that didn't work. And I sought advice on, okay, when your kid's doing this, what is something you can do to mitigate some of these things? And, and honestly, it only seemed to exacerbate the problem. I was driving home, and at first I was really angry. And I began to pray, and my prayer was very confounded. I don't know what to do. Will additional punishment create resentment? Will mercy be mistaken as weakness or approval? Will reasoning be looked at as an escape and go unheeded? What method to employ in this moment or is some combination of methods appropriate? And the answer was, I don't know. In that moment, I'm confounded. And I could bring before the greatest psychology experts and those that have raised a dozen children. And in truth be told, nobody exactly knows the appropriate response in the moment for each individual child. But the Spirit of God does. The Spirit knows. And as he sees me driving home, flailing in my weakness, what do I do? I've got 15 minutes. Now I've got 10 minutes. Now I've got five minutes. Now I've got two minutes. Now I'm sitting in the driveway, not knowing what to do. Lord, I don't even know what to pray for. Other than I know I need this to be corrected. Everything else about the situation completely escapes me. I hear of people's sickness. And the temptation is to pray for healing. That's the temptation. I don't know if that's what they need. Perhaps they need a thorn in the flesh for the rest of their life. Perhaps that same thing will humble them as it did Paul. Perhaps it will be the necessary linchpin or the hinge upon which their spiritual life is dependent upon to be able to be used of God. Perhaps their loss may be the removal of blinders for those whom they have prayed for that it would open their eyes to their spiritual need. And so maybe the very prayer of the one who is lying in bed dying is being answered by their death because those on looking will then have a broken heart, repent of their sins, and come to know God. And so do I pray for their healing? Or do I not? Because I love them and I'll miss them and it'll certainly do a lot of natural harm from what I can see. But is the spiritual benefit outweighing the physical, natural harm it might do? What do I pray? I think of that often as we come to election time. I certainly would encourage you to vote for the person who best reflects God's values in here. But maybe it's not God's. Well, we know that men are not lifted up into office of prominence without God's permissive will taking place. And perhaps an evil leader today will discourage the election of a much more evil leader tomorrow. I don't know that. You see, because I don't know the will of God altogether. And I don't know the infinitely complex things that he is doing to the millions and billions of people alive today in the fulfillment of his will. Maybe God is withholding salvation from someone that I love until the opportune time to make a display of their salvation that that display might have an effect upon hundreds of those around them. I'm not saying it is the case, but I'm not discounting that it could be. So I don't know what to pray. 
And I find myself very often left with the same utterances towards God. Lord, this is my will, but I want your will to be done. And that must be, that must be stamped deeply on the heart of every Christian prayer. Lord, I'm praying for what I desire as you have commanded in Mark, what is it, eleven twenty four? Pray for those things that you desire, believing. Always with this understanding that God, if my will is not aligned with yours, help me to pray according to your will. Oh, and that is a terrible prayer to pray. Terribly necessary, but also terribly crushing at times because it may require unspeakable pain and patience on your end. So the first thing that the Spirit helps us do is it helps us for what we're to pray for. Let me say this. If you come to a point in prayer where thoughts are flooding your mind so quickly that you cannot utter them quick enough so you just begin to cry, you're getting there. You're getting there. Because what God sees is the heart that is lifting up these groans. I changed my opinion about this verse this week. I always thought that the groans were the Spirit's groans. I don't think that anymore. We'll get there in a moment. We don't know what to pray. And then we don't know how to pray as we should. I don't know how to pray. Like, okay, here in a couple weeks, I'm going to go down to this preacher Bible study and a lot of young preachers there. And I, I was laughing with somebody here. You know, I think about some of my early sermons and, Man, I did not know how to study the Bible at all, and I'm embarrassed to think back at some of the things that I got up and preached and said, and I just, I hope they're not recorded, <laughs> all right? Um, it's just embarrassing, and, and um, not that I have figured it out, but I have figured some things out, just like I hope you have. That you study the Scriptures for years and years and years, and you've begun to get some methods that help you to extract through the Holy Spirit and, and through God's Word, the truth. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm going to teach on is, is how to study. How can you better study your Bible to, to get things? And, and so I, I feel like there's many that could do a better job, but I have, have, have studied some of that. Now, if my lesson was teach me how to pray, I'd have to respectfully decline. Because I, don't, I really don't know how to pray as I should. When you've heard it before, when the apostles, and I want to I be careful how I say this because it, it may not come out the way I intend it. When the apostles watched Jesus pray, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he taught them, he, that's where we get the Lord's Prayer. And you can see, as you study the content of the Lord's Prayer, a wonderful template on the things that you may and I may bring before God. Also, in that prayer, there's an attitude that Jesus displays towards the Father. And so, on the one hand, through the Lord's Prayer, we can ascertain the attitude that we ought to have, one of humility and reverence. We can also ascertain to some degree general requests that are appropriate and good. But the most vital part of prayer, we cannot get from that prayer. And that is, what's going on in your spirit and in mine when we pray? There is something indescribable that takes place. Think about when you have prayed and really prevailed before the throne of grace in prayer. 
For you, it may be two or three times you can go back to. Perhaps it's one time you can go back to. And as you reconstruct in your memory what is going on, you can maybe utter some helpful things that you notice or some things that you have, you have experienced before that are commonalities that are helpful. But there comes this place where you step from the carnal mind and realm to a spiritual realm and your heart begins to function in a way that is completely different than the average prayer that you offer to God. And to truly grasp prayer We must step into that realm and offer those things to God. And yet the only way that we can get into that realm is if the Spirit helps us and takes us there. He teaches us what to pray. And then he, the way I can see it even from this chapter, he temporarily completely nullifies the flesh and the carnal mind and allows us just for a moment to live completely under the influence of the Holy Spirit and yet it is still us. And suddenly that pure, saved, cleansed part of you is the part that is standing before the throne of grace before God. And then communion begins to take place. And yet it's so strange, that communion. Communion, is, uh, communion with God is so strange because for me and you to communicate, there must be words. That is the only written words, spoken word, facial expression, something. But there must be some visible or audible form of communication. And yet God is not that way. These things are too deep for me, but I feel like I need to say them anyway. So I hope the Holy Spirit will help you to get out what I'm I'm trying to say here. There are things that God can speak to me without words. And I don't understand that. Like I can be, seeking his will about something. I can be distressed about something. I can be mourning something. I can have all these litany of things. And God allows me to step what I think the Bible would call past the veil. I go into the Holy of Holies. And there he is there. And all of his glory is emanating both in sight and here, it just, it's just emanating, and there I am. And something is coming in that is spiritual, that is clear. And there is something going out of me to him. All the while, it not necessarily even being mentally verbal. And in those moments when I am behind the veil... And I am at the mercy seat of God. Or I am standing there rather in the presence of God. And we are communing with one another for just a few moments. More in my Christian life on every facet is done in just 10 seconds of being there than in all the years of seeking understanding outside of there. And yet, if you ask me, okay, how do you get to that place? I have no idea. Because there are days when I begin to pray, and it seems to me that I am as sincere on that day as I was on a day that I stepped behind the veil. But I don't get to go behind the veil. And I don't know why. You see, the Spirit helps us in what to pray, and also in how to pray. Now, I'll say this. If I'm describing something to you that does not sound familiar, try to get familiar with it. Because here's what I would say. That is the height of the Christian life. That. Being in the presence of God. 
is the height of the Christian life. So all this religiosity, the singing, the good feelings that may flutter in your heart from time to time when you're singing a song at home, or, those are good. And, I, and that even sounds like I'm demeaning this. I'm not trying to at all. But when you're in the presence of holiness and every faculty of yours is completely overcome by that holiness, I don't know. There's just, you can talk about an out-of-body experience. It is exactly that because your body is dead and you're alive in Christ. He helps us to pray as we ought. How does he do that? He tells us. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So here's how I always used to understand this. And I I dove into some of the Greek this week. And I don't think it really helped that much. But it did suggest something that I'll put before you today that, that helped me. So I always looked at it as this. You know, I get as far as I can in prayer and, and I bring my words and I lay them before the throne of God and then the Spirit then speaks to God with his groanings. And I don't think that's necessarily what that means anymore. I think rather, and I don't even know how to say this, the Spirit fills my groanings and may even provoke some of them. Like he takes me deeper and then he takes my groanings and he fashions them in accordance with the will of God. And he takes those very personal unutterable words and feelings and thoughts and he he assembles all of them in accordance with what he knows to be God's will. And then he brings my groanings before God. Now this morning, whether that is the case, whether the groanings are mine, one of the reasons I think that is because the last person to groan in the text in verse 23 was us. We are groaning to wait the redemption of our bodies. And then to me, we're groaning in the present to be delivered from our weakness. And the Spirit takes those groanings and brings them before God. He says that they're unutterable. They're unutterable. I, I like that. I like, how that's, I like how that's said. Because language has, in the spiritual realm, language has severe limitations. I mean really severe. So recognize that. Even the enlightened word, even the, let me say this, even the inspired word has limitations because it's words. What it requires is a divine language which is not in words. It's spirit speaking to spirit. Things that are known and recognized, things that are imputed to us, that is so deep and rich and real, it cannot be articulated to others. And so the spirit takes those unutterable desires that we have. And let me say this, I have many of those. I have many desires that if I sat down with you and you said, Brother Brad, give me three things you want me to pray for. First, we'd have to sit for quite a long time because they're big picture things. I want to see the salvation of my children. I want to see, you know, I could list off some things that are very important to me. But the, the deepest groanings of my heart are much bigger than that. And really, I could sit for an hour and explain to you just one of them, you know, and say, well, this is what I want to see happen. This is the reason I want this. And then maybe this would happen. And I could give you the little zigzag explanation back and forth to hopefully build this picture for you. But it wouldn't do what's really down there. And yet the Spirit can translate it to God for me when I can't. 
this morning, what ought to give us and what Paul is saying here ought to give us. Now, I love this chapter because what Paul is doing is, from what I can see, at least 18 times he's telling us things that should encourage us. But, again, this is my perception of it. He's saving the best for last in the chapter. He's marching closer and closer. Let this encourage you, brother. Let this encourage you, sister. Know this about the future. Know this about the present. And let me say, this verse 26, when you're discouraged and overwhelmed and disheartened, to, and even in prayer, when Satan is beating you up because you're so horrible at praying, because you probably are, because all of us are, unless we're enabled by the Spirit. So, you know, the best way, and this, this is where the world has got the doctrine wrong, so often Satan throws a dart at us and says, you're horrible at praying. And the world wants to tell us, no, you're not, you're doing a great job. No, what we need to do is say, no, I am horrible at praying, but praise God, the Spirit will help me to do what I cannot of my own ability and strength. And so don't look at someone and say, you know what, Brother Ron is really good at praying. I wish I could never be like that. That's not the case. With the Spirit of God, God can help you. And he stair steps and he gets to the very end of the chapter and he throws open in the last three verses this Amazing. Talk about unutterable things. Who can separate us from the love of God? What is more encouraging than that? Because it, he brings up, he says, you know, who is he that condemneth if God justifies? Let me say that in a different way about our text. If God enables you through his spirit to pray, Who or what can stop you from praying like that? If God is going to help you, nothing can impede upon that ability to go before God in prayer and lay those infirmities and weakness down and be empowered by the Spirit to do so. And he says, who can separate us from the love of God? And what greater display, there are some, but what a great display of God's love that he even helps us to ask for help in our embarrassing weakness. And he'll do that. Do not. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say that. If you're going to neglect a spiritual discipline, don't let it be prayer. If you're going to neglect a spiritual discipline, don't let it be prayer. You know what you're supposed to say? Don't neglect any of them. And I know that. But listen, prayer, whole another another level here. Whole another place here. I'm thankful today the Spirit will help us to pray. Let me say this. Of all the things, I've said this once here before. Of all the things that concern me about the younger generation and about this whole screen thing, this, this iPhone screen thing. The number one thing that concerns me about it is that it will prevent them from learning how to pray. To me, as a Christian, if you have a trouble with that little device, you can't get away from it. Perhaps the greatest harm and damage it is doing to you is you forfeiting the presence of God for the presence of whatever you're looking at. And it terrifies me. Listen, there are people, when I was lost, there was a lady at Southside Missionary Baptist Church. We just called her Nan. I don't know what her real name was, but that's what we called her was Nan. Nan Russell. She was quiet. She was coarse, somewhat rough in, her, in the way she would talk to kids sometimes. But there were days in service when she would pray. And I was nine years old, ten years old when we moved there, and I'd go there on occasion. And there was only two or three times that I saw it. But I tell you, there was something about it that I could, I could ignore everything else but I could not 
ignore the divine interaction taking place. Told you before about Brother Nathan York, and he would pray. I loved to just be a little fly on the wall when I would listen to him pray. There was something that was so compelling, and I could sense the presence of God there. Do you know what will have a greater influence upon children, your children, my children, our children, our church, our visitors, than anything else? You know what will have a bigger effect on us than anything else? People hearing somebody commune with God. And here's what I fear. When they don't see it, they don't even know that it exists. Like, I'm afraid this morning that many of the things I've spoken about experimentally, the young people are sitting here saying, what is he talking about? And yet, for those of you that are a little older, that have witnessed it and others, says, you know what? He did a terrible job explaining it, but I know exactly what he's talking about. I recognize because it's a spiritual perception. And what a wonderful thing when they can hear because then they can internalize. That's what prayer is. Because Satan is busy at work and he, here's what he's doing. He's equating in the social media universe thinking with prayer and thinking and praying for you. And the result of that becoming a common phrase within our vernacular is it completely diminishes what prayer is. And then at the same time, he is removing, for various reasons, the display before people of what true communing with God is. And so all at one time, the definition and meaning of prayer is changing right before our very eyes, and our children have no idea what it really is. And it necessitates us saying, God, help me to pray. Help me. One day, I'm closing with this. One day, brother Nathan was praying at his house. And me and his grandson were there, staying the night. I was probably 17 18 years old. And we listened to him pray. He didn't know we were listening. We were listening to him pray. He got all wound up praying. And we were just listening. You know, at first we were poking little jokes, just, you know, when you see something funny or hear something funny, it's just what you do as a kid, I guess. And all of a sudden it just got real somber between the both of us. And this thought came to me, when he dies, is that going to die with him? Like, in other words, will there be anybody else that I know that I can be around to pray like that? Landry got his heart diagnosis years ago. Shortly thereafter, I called Brother Nathan, and I said, Brother Nathan, because the doctor had told us that surgery was imminent. It was going to come probably the next month. I said, Brother Nathan... I don't want a bunch of people up at the hospital. I don't want a whole bunch, even my family up there. I want my wife there. I'm going to be there. There's two people that I want there. One of them's you. The other is somebody who can pray. Because what I wanted in that little room was prayer. This morning, I'm thankful it's not a talent that it is imputed by the Holy Spirit and that that is a unbelievable comfort to us in the midst of suffering. I hope this morning that that will jettison you to pray, give you an appetite to pray. I would be okay if a more prominent part of our service was dedicated to prayer. And I confess, I don't know what that looks like. Wouldn't you be okay with that? I mean, you can't orchestrate. You can't say, okay, we're going to pray for 45 minutes today. But there seemed to be this thing with that older generation, that is most of now, which is dead and gone, 
You know, like when they would get together, and some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about because it happened in these very four walls. When you had prayer meeting and there was something on the horizon or there was something going on and they came to pray, it was different. It was just different. Came in, people began to pray, and just, it's like it didn't stop. Just kept going and going. And then one person, you ever had this happen before? You get, you, for, you know, you just stop praying. Somebody else keeps praying. And all of a sudden they say something, and it like reignites the fire. And you had forgotten about this whole swath of things that then the Holy Spirit brings to your heart. And you think, how did I stop praying? I totally forgot about this. And then it just opens all back up. And then you start praying. And they stop. And then God brings something to their mind. And they start praying again. And when you're in prayers like that, I've been in a prayer before it lasted three or four hours. In private. Outside, in shorts and a t-shirt, under a pavilion. Because that's exactly what was going on. Is that the Spirit would warm our hearts. Life-changing event for me. Can be for you too, I hope. I hope this has been some good to you today. I appreciate these scriptures the Lord left behind. And I appreciate that God will help us to pray.